Hey there, Belongers. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. Today, we start a brand new series called Identity ID Theft. Identity Theft is one of the most rampant crimes, cyber crimes, is sweeping across America. Just in case you don't know what identity at theft is, identity theft is when someone steals your information. Say it's your social security number, your credit card numbers, your phone number, your email, and they impersonate you. And then they begin to purchase things in your name or to uh, to buy stuff in your name to get stuff that doesn't belong to them. Everyone is trying to figure out. There's all kinds of people trying to figure out how do you stop identity theft? Not long ago, a 31-year-old woman in Chicago got a call from a car dealership thanking her for the purchases that she had made at their car dealership. Now, here's the problem. She had not made any purchases. And so when she went to the car dealership and talked to them, she discovered that someone had stolen her identity and had purchased three cars in her name. So recently, I had someone try to steal my identity. Now, I've learned that there are folks out there, 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 there are folks out there who try to take advantage of older people, try to prey on older people. Now, I don't think of myself as an older person. I think of myself as a young person, except when I get finished leg day with my trainer. But usually, I think of myself as a younger person. The problem is the identity thief people I, they they kind of thought I was old. So I got this email into my personal email. Now, Google has, you know, they have email. They have your primary email. And then they have, you know, people who are trying to sell you something. And then they have people who are who are trying to, um, who are pe people maybe you know, but they're not your primary people. So when I get a primary email, I just assume these people know me. So I got a primary email from Norton virus protection company. And here's what it said. It said, Dear Mr. Hayward, we just want you to know that your virus protection will renew in one day. And the cost is $495 for the annual subscription. So if you want to cancel this subscription, you need to give us a call within 24 hours at this number. Now, I don't remember getting any Norris protection, so naturally, I did not want to incur a $495 on my bill. So I took the number that, I, that they gave me, and I called them to explain to them that I had not ordered any Norris virus protection. So when I called, first of all, there was a little bit of accent on the line, and I could hear multiple people in some type of call center. And so as I began to say to them, well, I don't want to incur this amount, they said, well, we need some more information from you. If you would give us your social security number. And I started to think to myself, why did they need my social security number? And they said, well, if you give us your number, your social security number, if you would give us your debit card and your expiration date and, and your secret code, we will make sure that that never hits your account. Well, I, I'm not the brightest bulb in the closet, but, but something seemed a little fishy. So as I was talking to them on the phone, I was on my computer kind of looking up Northness virus protection fraud. And there it was all in front of me. Folks literally will send you the email to try to tell you that you're going to get this uh, charge. And as you call them to get the charge off, then they begin to get information from you so they can really rip you off. So after I, I saw this, I began to assume another, another identity. I, beside, I began to talk about stuff like the FBI and, and fraud protection, and suddenly I was disconnected from the call. Now, I'm the kind of person that wouldn't just leave it there. So I called them back. And I had another conversation with them and I began to, and I, I guess it was another person on the line. So they didn't know the conversation that I just had. And I went right to this thing about identity death. And I talked about the FBI and, and how I knew people at the FBI that, that dealt with this issue. And all of a sudden, again, the line went down. I don't know what happened there, but the line went down. Well, in this new series, this new series, Identity Death. We will be asking three questions, three questions, I think, that are questions of our culture that will help us understand our identity. The first question, and by the way, we're going to be asking it from this perspective. 
What does the culture say about these three questions? And what does the truth of the Bible say about these three questions? Here are the three questions. Who is God? Number one, who am I? Number two, and three, who are we in community? From the culture's perspective and from God's words. It's distressing when someone tries to steal your identity. But, but who would have the nerve to try to steal the identity of God? Who would dare take the name of God and use it to represent something other than what's really him? But someone has done this. The people do it all the time in many pastorates, in many, on many campuses, in many homes, through many relationships across the country. People are stealing God's identity by misrepresenting him. Some try to steal his identity by talking about a prosperity God. They say that he's only concerned with your health and your wealth and your prosperity. They say that this God is all about your stuff. Others try to steal his identity by talking about a universalistic, say that three times fast, God. All paths lead to God. All gods are one. Some people promote what I call a Burger King God, right? Who says, have it your way. Whatever you want, I'm all about it. All sin is acceptable. Love triumphs all judgment. And it's not sin. They say it's a lifestyle. Some folks declare that God is limited. That the reason why sin exists in the world because, is because he's not all powerful. And he can't do anything about it. Others affirm that God is a political God, that, that God is a God that needs to be elected every four years, and that, that, that God has to declare a political party. Finally, some folks says that, that God is just legalistic. All he cares about is did you make the right decisions and the wrong decisions, and, and if you do that, he's all fine. But these are not the gods of the Bible because God's identity has been stolen. See, here's what, I, here's what I understand. If for us to understand who we are, we have to understand who God is. So, so I want to take you to the story uh, in, in Exodus. I want you to take you to a story that includes God and Moses and, so that God can really tell you and you can really understand who God is. Here's the point of this message. When we catch a vision of God's true identity, our natural response is to fall down and worship him. So who is God? The Bible talks about, he says this, I am that I am. Each of us has, to, has a desire to promote a God that serves us rather than us serving God. Each of us wants to take God and squeeze us into a mold so that he fits our agenda and so that our will can be done and not his will be done. We like to create what I call designer gods that meet our desires, that fulfill who we are. But based on the truth, based on the truth of God's word, under the, I, I just want to just give you what God says about who he is. So in Exodus 34, God says this, God passed in front of him, this is Moses, and called out, God, God, a God of mercy and grace endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sin. He holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sin to the third and fourth generation. So in these verses, as Moses climbs the mountain, to encounter God, God describes himself. You want to know who God is? Don't take someone else's word. Don't take the culture's word. Don't believe the culture's lies. If you want to know who God is, listen to what the resume that he writes about himself. I love this text because it is God speaks for himself. God says, this is who I am. Am. And as Moses asked God to show him his glory, God responds and gives him a description of himself. God gives him his resume. Moses knows who God really is, but the passage begins with the God, God. Immediately, God gives Moses his name. God calls himself Yahweh. It, it translated to Lord or, or Adonai. He says, I am that I am. In other words, what he implicitly says to Moses is, I am that I am, which means I was, 
I am and I will be. In other words, he has never not existed. He has always existed. He will always exist. Moses, let me explain my I amness to you because I amness has to be defined for you to really understand who I am and what's going to happen in the next season of your life. Here's the deal. As long as you walk with God, you will never know everything about him. Every now and then, God has to define himself in a new way. You will discover new things about yourself because you discover new things about God. But God hasn't changed. Sometimes you see him in a fresh way. And sometimes he gives you a fresh view of how great God is. So he's not only the God that says, I am that I am. He's also the God of mercy and grace. God says, I am a God of mercy and grace. Think about it. Of all God's divine attributes, of all the things that we say about God, think about his power and his knowledge and his wisdom. Yet God starts with his mercy. Mercy. He starts with mercy. Isn't it interesting? We like to talk about power. We like to talk about all these things. But God says mercy. Many of us want people to know who we are what we do, where we've been, and where we accomplish. But God has nothing to prove. He says, I'm a merciful and gracious God. The word mercy or, or compassionate comes from the Hebrew word, comes from the Hebrew word that means womb. It refers to maternal nature of a mother to her child. It can be expanded to include not only the mother, but the father as well. It describes a parent, a parent's care, for his or her child. God says, when you think about me, I want you to think about the mercy and compassion that signifies my nature. Think about a mother who's willing to cut up food so that their, her infant daughter or son can finally enjoy a meal. Think about a mother or dad that gets up in the middle of the night to walk with a child and, and, and to help the child and to rock the child back to sleep. And God says, when you think about how a good parent loves their child, cares for their child, watches over their child, looks after their child. I want you to think about me. God cares about you. Who is God? God is the person that cares about you. God has concern for you. Surely Moses needed to hear this, to know that God cares. As many today need to know the same thing. God cares about you. God cares about your situation. God cares what you're going through right now. You might be listening to me and you are going through a hard place. Can I say to you that when you think of who God is and what God identity is all about, would you understand that God cares for you? But this verse, verse also couples compassion with grace. God cares when he doesn't even have to care. The Bible says when we were of no use whatsoever, Jesus died for us. He cares when he doesn't get anything out of the relationship. He cares when we can't even repay him for his caring. He cares when we blow him off and walk away from him. He still cares. He cares with no ulterior motive. He cares because that's his nature. He comes and says, Moses, I am a merciful, I am a gracious God, and oh, how they need it how Moses needed to know that God was merciful and gracious, that God cares. He cares so much that in Exodus 1, the Bible says the people of Israel were going through a season of suffering. But in Exodus 2, they cried out to God, and the Bible says that God showed concern. God showed concern for their cities. When Israel looked over their history, God cares showed up over and over and over again. And I think as you look through your life, God's mercy his grace has shown up. His caring has shown up over and over and over again. It's true in the life of Moses and it's true in our lives. In chapter 2, Moses should have died because every boy was destined to be killed. But because of God's compassionate graciousness, God made a basket and put him in the stream at the right time with the right parents and delivered him into the right home to the right woman 
Moses in, is on the mountain, Exodus 34, and because God is compassionate and gracious, every time you turn a page in the Bible, you see God's compassion, you see his grace. Look at your own story. You made it through trials. You made it through a whole bunch of stuff. Why? Because, because God is compassionate and gracious. Gracious. God has shown and will continue to show you grace. God will not only see you, but he will get involved in the details of your life. God is a gracious, compassionate God. You want to know who God is? You want to know what God's identity is? He's the one who was and is and who is to come. And he's also the gracious and compassionate God. I'm going to finish his resume when I get back. Welcome back. We're talking about identity, identity theft, and what it means to have your identity stolen. And we're starting this first message off talking about God's identity and how God's identity, how God's identity has been stolen by the culture and all the things that the culture says about God and the way the culture tries to squeeze God into his mold and make a God that serves them instead of them serving God. And so what we're doing is we're setting the story straight. We're giving the truth of God's word, God's true identity, and God's true identity, we said in the first part of this message, was all about the God who is, who was, and who is to come. And then we talked about him being the God of compassion and grace. So secondly, the Bible says that God is the patient, loving, faithful, and loyal. The text continues, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love. God talks about his loving kindness and his faithfulness. The Hebrew word hesed. Chesed describes the covenant love, the unfailing love, the loyal love of God between himself and his people. He tells Moses, I want you to know. I want you to know that I'm going to be with you, Moses. I want you to know that I keep every commitment. I am consistent all the time. I am always loyal to those I call my children. He says, Moses, you can depend on me. My love relationship, my, my love, my relationship, my commitment to you will never fail. In a day and in an age where commitments fall, in a day and an age where people are here today and gone tomorrow, God says, I am faithful, I am loyal, I am committed in my love. He describes this commitment right after Israel betrayed him. In Exodus 32, the Israelites made a, a idol, a calf kind of a, a idol, you know, something that they made up and they made it of gold. And because, because Moses took too long, they decided that they were going to worship this golden calf. And against the backdrop of this unfaithfulness, God says, I'm faithful. Against the backdrop of their failure, the disappointment, their impatience, God says, I am reliable. I am consistent. I am available. I am dependable. I am here when you're not. Has not been true in our own lives. When we've been unfaithful, God has been faithful. When we, be, when we have been, you know, when we've not been dependable, God is dependable. He says, you can't even compare who I am to what you used to. It, 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 it's, it, you kind of think about it. It's trying to get a glimpse of God. He said he is so far above what we're used to. Well, he's so far above the relationships that we're used to having where people don't keep their commitments. The reality is we can't understand his loyalty and his commitment and his reliability and his consistency because we don't see anything like it in our lives. We live in a Bernie Madoff. Remember Bernie Madoff, the great ripoff artist? the great Ponzi scheme artists that ripped people out of billions of dollars. We live in that world. We live in that deceptive world. We live in the days of prenuptial agreements that, you know, we look at, live in a world of fine print and, and church-free agency where people shop for churches like they shop for new clothes. We live in the days of rising divorce rates and failing marriages. We can't find loyalty and commitment anywhere, but God says, I am am faithful. I will never leave you or forsake you. No temptation has seized you, but that which is common to humanity. And God is faithful. He's so faithful that if we confess our sins, if we, if we admit to him that we've blown it, he is a God who is faithful. He's a God who is just. And the Bible says he'll forgive us from all of our 
sins and he will purify us. The text says loyal in love for a thousand generations. Now, I believe this means that God will last. Politicians come and go. Jobs come and go. Officials come and go. Pastors come and go. Relationship problems through job, health problems through family problems, through relationship problems, through job problems, through legal problems, through recession, through every Democrat and every Republican, and every independent that comes and goes with all kinds of plans and promises that get broken, God will last. He'll also outlast. He'll outlast the buzz of the bottle. He'll outlast the hit of the joint. He'll outlast the high of the opioid addictions. He'll outlast the smell of new cars and fake friends and real enemies. John the Apostle said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Here's what it says in John 1, 1 through 3. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God in readiness from, for God from day one. Everything was created through him, and nothing, nothing, not one thing. Your identity is you can't. You want, to know what, you want to know what your identity is? I know we're going here next week. You want to know what your identity is? You came to be because God wanted you to come to be. Isaiah 48 says like this, True, the grass withers and the wild, wildflowers fade, but our God's word stands firm forever. Psalms 91 to 2 says this, God, it seems like you've been our home forever, long before the mountains were born, long before you brought earth is self to birth, you once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. He'll last, he'll last, and he'll last, and he'll last. Yes, he will, he'll last. He says, I want you to know that he's faithful. I want you to know that he's loyal. He, when he puts his resume out together for you, he says, I am gracious. I am caring. But he also says, he also says that I am patient, I am loving, I'm faithful, and I'm, I'm, and I'm loyal. So, so here's the next thing in his resume. He's forgiving and just. He says, finally, I'm forgiving and just, God. Forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Each of those words speak about how awful our condition really are. It really is, excuse me. They help remind us how messed up we are in sin, that, that we've blown it. And so here's the God who is forgiven, forgiving and just. One term means to miss the mark. The other means to break our relationship with God. And another means to disobey or rebel against God. That there were people born in the sin, sin of our hand, what we do, and sin of our heart, what we've inherited. Any way you look at it, we're in a bad situation because the wages of sin is death. But in front of all of those descriptions of sin, stuff like rebellion and wickedness, there's another word, forgiving. The word shake away. God word, nasa, means to lift up and carry and take away. God lifts the burden of sin from our lives. Last week, I had opportunity to spend some time with the, my spiritual dad, David, Pastor David Bowen, who, uh, who, who uh, was so instrumental into my life and my call and my knowing the Lord is Jesus. And one of David, the, the things that David does is David works in prison ministry now. And he told the story that he told the story of what it means to really forgive. And he, so he told a story of a person who had uh, a person who had murdered a family son. The person that married, murdered the family's son, the person had been put on trial, convicted, and put in jail. Uh, and something interesting happened. As the person was being sentenced to jail, you know, sometimes they will say to the parents, you can get up and say something. And these two parents who had lost their son because of this person's sin got up and said, we, for we forgive. It shocked the courtroom. We forgive you. And it wasn't just something they said in the courtroom. They said they forgave him. And of course, the, that guy went off to jail, but they began to visit him in the jail. 
they began to have a relationship with him and befriended him and began to love him as their own son. I mean, they, they, they provided for his need. They visited him in jail. And once the guy was released, they did the unimaginable. Their forgiveness went to a place where they basically adopted this guy, brought this guy into their own home and treated him as their son. This story reminds me of how God has forgiven us. He's invited us into his own home. We are in his house because he has lifted the burden of sin off of us through the death of Jesus Christ. He is forgiving and he's just. And then he says, meet at the cross, the old songs, be left unpunished. Because there's this mercy and justice, meet at the cross, the old song says. It seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Because here's the deal, unless we avail ourselves of the graciousness of God, then, then what our, our sin does have consequences. The Bible says he doesn't ignore sins, but he holds people accountable for them. God says for he forgives. Then the next sentence he says he's going to punish. How does he do this? First, forgiveness for those who know how to repent. But those who do not repent will be punished. And then it says, but he is slow to anger. He is slow to anger. He's willing that no one would perish, but that everybody would come to know him. When I think about how God forgives me, and when I think about how God has lifted the burden of sin for me, I, I, I almost have to have this spirit of forgiveness. The text says, forgive others because what God in Christ Jesus has done for me. The text says, in conclusion, that Moses hears God's resume. Moses hears God's description. Moses hears God defines his own identity, and he falls down on his knees to worship God. Exodus 34, 8 through 9 says this, At once Moses fell to the ground, and he worshiped, saying, Please, O Master, if you see anything good in me, please, Master, travel with us, hard-headed as these people are. Forgive us our iniquity and sin. Own us, possess us. The true identity of God will always lead to worship. Anytime you see God, anytime you get a glimpse of how great he is, how forgiving he is, how loving he is, how merciful he is, when anytime you get a glimpse of how caring he is, that he's faithful, he's patient, the only thing you can do is fall down on your knees and worship and adore him. And you just fall down. Real glimpse of God's true identity. All the talking stops. And you just fall down. So Mo Moses falls down on the side of the mountain because he's come face to face with the great God that he serves. Every time you talk about the true identity of God, don't try to redefine him. Don't try to bring him down to your level. Share who he is. Share who he, who he is. When I got ready to start working, uh, I didn't have a social security number at the age of 12. There was a program that I could start working early, and I didn't have a Social Security number. And so we had to go to the Social Security office and say, I don't have a number. And so the Social Security office made us come up with a number of things. They made us find, get our birth certificate. I didn't have a birth certificate either. Remember, I was born at one pound, seven ounces with a sister who was born at one pound, nine ounces. They didn't expect us to live, so they never did a birth certificate. They never did a, a Social Security card or anything like that. And so the first thing I had to do is go and get our birth certificate. So we had to take our parents' birth certificates, and they went down there, and they got me a birth certificate. And then they had to take that to the Social Security office. They had to do proof, proof, proof of residency and all of that kind of stuff. They had to prove my identity. Well, 2,000 years ago, God did just that. He got tired of people misrepresenting him. He got tired of people giving false identities, stealing his identity. So he, said, so he said, I can't send a prophet. I can't send a priest. I can't send a king. I can't. He moved in the neighborhood, and I'm going to go myself. So God put on the robe. He moved in his neighborhood and, and put on the robe of humanity. And he came down through 42 generations. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of a virgin Mary. And he did miracle after miracle. Jesus gave sight to the blind and he 
gave voice to the people that could not talk and, and gave hearing to the deaf. And after serving 30 years, he put his life in the hands of the people he created. And he went through a trial and was wrongly convicted. He was beaten. He carried his cross and gave up his life on a hill called Calvary. They put him in a borrowed tomb. He stayed all Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. But on Sunday morning, he got up and said, it's time to reclaim my identity. And he rose. And, and the God who was, is, and will always be. You want to know what Jesus is, what God's identity is all about? His identity is all about his mercy and his grace. His identity is all about his patient, loyal, faithful love. His identity is about his forgiveness and justice. <laughs> the world says God is all of these things. He's the, he's the uh, candy machine. You know, you put your money in, you pull the stopper. No, God is, is and was and is to come. He's a God that cares about you, the God who knows your name, the God who created you in your mother's womb. That God, that God, the God who's been redeeming down through the years, loves you, loves you, and wants to have a relationship with you. Don't, he's giving you his resume. No, God's identity. He's giving you his resume. It's right there in Exodus. Now you know God. It will help you know who you are. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for this, this uh, resume that you've given us right out of your word. There's all kinds of lies in the culture, but you tell us who you really are. And Father, not only have you told us who you are, you have proved it down time and eternity. You have kept every promise. You've kept every commitment You've been the God who cares, the God who loves, the God who is gracious, the God who is patient, the God who is forgiving, the God who is just, and much, much more. So, Father, would you help us with our response to who you are? Our response is to worship you with all that we are, with our lives. So, Father, would you may. Thank you so much, Father, for taking the time to write your own resume. So, Father, there might be people here today who, who, don't, who, who bought the lie of the culture, who didn't realize that you are this God. You're the God who starts with mercy and ends with justice. Maybe there's someone listening to me today that doesn't realize that's who you are. And today, for the very first time, they realized who you are. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to respond with worship, which is giving you worth in our lives. So maybe today a person doesn't know you in relationship, but they want to. It's not very hard. Lord, you, you, you just uh, request that we, we basically surrender ourselves to you, that we ask that you would take away our bent towards doing our own thing, Take away the sins of our hand. Forgive us as we repent. And clearly, identity that always... Now, there's some people who've been on the journey for a little while, and slowly but surely, identity that always creeps in. It's not obvious, because if it was obvious, we wouldn't fall for it. But it just creeps in little by little by little. It may right be somebody today that's been in the church a long time, and identity death is just creeping in little by little by little. Today, Father, would you... Open our eyes to the truth of your word. And would you help us to respond to truth in worship? Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for showing us your resume. We pray this thanks, these things and thank you ahead of time. In Jesus' name, amen.